Well, thanks everyone for uh, allowing me to speak to your group. <coughs> I always enjoy speaking to, to, to a big groups like this. And is this my clicker? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. Perfect. Um, one quick housekeeping note before I get rolling here. Uh, I, I'm, I think I'm in technology jungle here. I've got two microphones going. I'm not sure which one works, but one of them is supposed to be recording my voice. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, the one that's recording me is gonna be posted on my website in the next few days. And I'm gonna put it on there and, and make it available to be downloaded and, and watched. Um, with that being said, if you'd like access to that or if you want a copy of my slides after my talk today come up and give me your business card and uh, I'll send the slides to you later on today or tomorrow um, when you saw the, the when you looked at the calendar and saw that someone's going to be speaking to you about type 2 diabetes you probably thought uh, maybe I should stay home or there's no way a topic like this can be exciting my job is to, to make it exciting uh, for you to hear about this. It, and it maybe not uh, jumping around and doing backflips exciting, but maybe uh, exciting enough that uh, it spurs you to some type of action, um, either in, for yourself or someone else that you know that has you that This is something that I'm obsessed with. I go and speak. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons uh, for that, well, most of which I'll get into today. Um, but the most important thing about what I'm talking, about what I will be speaking about today, and the message that I want you to hear, is that regardless of what you believe, regardless of what you've been told by someone sitting to your right or to your left, or some healthcare professional, Type 2 diabetes is not forever. It's not a lifelong sentence. There's things that you can do about it, and there's things that, uh, frankly, you should be doing. And after today, hopefully, you will be doing, uh, because it will spur you in the action, into action. Because if, if you just follow the standard protocol of treatment and management, uh, it, the, the last few years of life for a type 2 diabetic aren't very nice. So if you know anyone that's died of type 2 diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to try to stay on schedule as much as I can. I can talk about this topic. I could stand up here without a slide and talk for two hours. So my, my problem is going to be not going off into the weeds on, on some tangent. Uh, so if you have questions afterwards, um, please feel free to come up and talk to me. Um, take one of my cards and uh, send me an email. Because uh, I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to help you. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is type two diabetes and why it's a problem and what you can do to fix the problem, either within yourself or if you're in some kind of a leadership position as an employee benefits broker, um, as a consultant, or within a company, how you can address it within your group. And I'm going to start with this, and I'll explain this in a little bit more detail later on. But if, if anyone has type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, or if you know someone that has either of those conditions, we have this criteria to classify people uh, based on their blood sugar as to whether or not they're type 2 diabetic, pre-diabetic, or normal, right? Um, and if you're normal, consistently your blood sugar is below 100. If you're type two, if you're pre-diabetic, your blood sugar is between 100 and 125, and if you're type two diabetic, it's your blood sugar is 126 and, and above. Uh, and, and I, I didn't put the curse word up there because I wasn't sure the the crowd I was going to be speaking to today, but I called it boldly, and uh, it, it it implies some things that are just not true. It, those kind of criteria and, and classification schemes imply that if your blood sugar is 99, it's okay, but if it's 100, you're now pre-diabetic, as if that one little unit 
uh, milligrams per deciliter, which is a really small number, as, as, as if changing that number matters. And similarly, if, if going from 125 to 126 is a major difference between prediabetes and, and type 2 diabetes. So these things are just random, and they don't really mean anything except for the ability to classify someone. And from a health perspective, they're really bull bleep, as you'll see, because I've summarized tons of research to indicate that there are problems with these numbers and why you need to do something to address this and, and not just wait uh, until later. And so this is a problem on all levels, whether it be you as an individual, whether it be um, Memorial Hermann or Methodist Hospital System, it's a problem, whether it's you as an employer or your employer, it's a problem everywhere because we don't do a good job of identifying people that have a problem that can lead to type 2 diabetes. And so we're missing a bunch of people. Does anyone happen to know what the current CDC estimate is for the number of type 2 diabetics there are in this country? It's around 30 million. And, and they have, and so we've got 300 million people, so it's roughly one in 10. Uh, and, and then there's another 70 or so million that are in that other category of pre-diabetes which means you're not diabetic, but you're not normal, you're kind of uh, in between. So you're looking at roughly 100 million adults. But if we did the right screening, we would be pushing 150 or 160 million adults. Basically, 53% of the adult population in the United States, every other person has some form of diabetes based on these criteria. And so we really need to do something about it because as, as we'll talk about here in just a minute, the way we treat it doesn't really do anything to alleviate any of the problems down the road. We're just kind of kicking the can down the road as to, to coin a phrase. So here, here's the problem and, and why I think we need to all be more cognizant of this issue and we all need to do something about it. Uh, if you look at there on the left, um, we've got a grouping that's called normal, and below that, um, I've kind of described it as mixed. Uh, in the middle, I've called that group pre, and, and I've described that as 100%. And over here on, on your right, that's the, that, uh, that stands for type 2 diabetes mellitus, or type 2 diabetes. And I've listed that as never leave. So what does this mean? Well, if you go all the way on the left, you've got people that are walking around that should be doing something about their blood sugar and their health, but the doctor says they're normal because they're using a test that's not identifying them as needing to take action. So we call these people, the CDC and the NIH, they call these people uh, undiagnosed. So they're walking around and, and they don't know they have it. And most people that you know, and, and this may be the case for you if you are type 2 diabetic, and most people that are type 2 diabetic think they're perfectly fine and then they go to the doctor tomorrow and they come back diagnosed as type 2 diabetic and that day they get prescribed five, six, or seven medications because of it. So we've got a big chunk, chunk of people that are walking around that have it but don't know it. And then we put them in this arbitrary category called pre-diabetes that I don't really like that term because you're, you, you either have a problem or you don't. Uh, there's kind of no in between. Uh, and the problem with this is the way we treat people with almost all chronic conditions, but type 2 diabetes in particular, we're, we, we do nothing but address the symptoms of the problem. So almost 100%, virtually every person that is diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic, within four years are going to be type 2 diabetic. Almost everybody. And so what happens then, they all end up in this red box and they never leave. So that population of people continues to grow and grow and grow. And if you know anything about the obesity statistics, if you know anything about our, our dietary habits, it's only going to be worse. And so let me, 
Was there a question? Oh, I thought I heard something. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I won't touch on it too much because Graham did a great job. Uh, we're going to uh, identify or define uh, type 2 diabetes in a second. Uh, we'll talk about why this is an issue. And then importantly, I'm going to talk about what you can do on a personal level to eliminate that condition, put it in remission, or prevent it if you're at risk or have family that uh, have a family history of it. Uh, I won't really get, I mean, you've got a good um, background on me from, from Graham, so I'm going to go ahead and, and skip that. And the, the, the purpose of this picture here is to, I want you guys to understand, um, yes, this is what I do every day. This is my job, and, and I'm kind of obsessed with helping people that are diabetic get better. But just because it's my job and it's uh, something that I can't stop really doing, uh, doesn't mean it's not important for the general public. If you pay, if you go see a doctor, and if healthcare costs are a concern to you, then you need to be paying attention to type 2 diabetes. We've got a tidal wave coming and we need to do something to address it. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick sidebar story. In the state of California, I think they have a, um, their Medicaid program for the state, I think it's called CalAid or uh, something like that. 2015, um, oh, every year they allocate um, money for people that are uninsured to receive services uh, in the hospital system. In 2015, they allocated a certain number of uh, dollars, uh, they, they allocated money to pay for a certain number of diabetes related amputations. Their actuaries, which are usually pretty accurate, their actuaries underbid that amount by 21%. That's not a, that's not a little measurement error. That's not half a percent. And when you, when you talk about the, the California state government sponsored insurance plan, you're not talking about $100,000 either. You're talking about a big chunk of money. And so it's going to be a problem for us too. Uh, think about this. If you've been in Houston for 15 to 20 years, 15 or 20 years ago, you probably had to go out of your way or maybe you never even noticed a dialysis clinic. Now, how many do you see on your daily drive? If, you, if you're not in the healthcare business, you may not know, but I want you to start paying attention. They're almost like Starbucks. They're all over the place. Why is that? Because we have so many people with diabetes that have kidney problems that this dialysis clinic virtually serves as their foster kidneys. They go and get everything filtered. And that's expensive. And so all of this is affecting all of us, no matter what we think. It may not, we may not have diabetes, that's great. But whatever you pay, is a, the cost of that is affected adversely by, by type 2 diabetes. So this is something we all need to uh, pay attention to and address. So what is type 2 diabetes? Uh, and I'm, I'm differentiating this from, from, type two, from type 1 diabetes, but I'm talking about type 2 diabetes and everything that we hear about in terms of diabetes is in relation to blood sugar, right? The criteria that, w that I talked about earlier, what's your blood sugar? Is it below 100? Is it between 100 and 125? Is it 126 and above? We well, do all these things to classify people based on their blood sugar. <coughs> Excuse me. Then once we get diagnosed, everything is blood sugar centric. All the pharmaceutical things that that are prescribed are geared towards reducing blood sugar. If that was the problem, that would be great. But that's not the problem because if it fixed the problem when your prescription ran out after a few months, you wouldn't have to keep getting it refilled. But you have to. And you take that medicine forever. Um, I said it's expensive. Uh, December of t 2016, the Journal of American Medical Association, or JAMA, this, the flagship journal for medicine, published a study that tracked over 100,000 uh, people for 14 years, I believe. For 14 years, and they tracked their personal medical expenses. Over that 14-year period, 
type 2 diabetes was more expensive. They, they, I think they tracked like 155 different conditions. Type 2 diabetes was more expensive than every cancer combined. Now we all hear about how expensive cancer drugs are, how expensive cancer treatment is. We hear about these liver and hepatitis prescriptions, how expensive they are. We never really hear in the news. I mean, every once in a while you may start paying attention and hearing things about insulin, which is uh, just ridiculously expensive. But we don't hear about how expensive type 2 diabetes is. It's the most expensive condition to have in terms of your own pocketbook. And for your insurance, the, the, the people that pay the balance, it's expensive for them too. Now this, is, this explains why this arbitrary, why, why these um, uh, arbitrary cutoff points are bull bleeding, right? So earlier I said the, if you're normal, your blood sugar is below 100, right? So you're supposed to be normal. Um, there's a, a huge area of research that looks at insulin and insulin resistance and, and type 2 diabetes and trying to get better at diagnosing um, the condi condition. Some of this research is starting, a lot of the research is starting to show things like this. If you take people that have a normal blood sugar below 100 and you classify them as either low, medium, or high in terms of their insulin resistance score, and then if you track them for seven years to find out what conditions they are diagnosed with, the people with the lowest insulin resistance score are diagnosed with zero conditions. So they're all normal, but there are variations of health within normal. If you are on the high end of the score, but still normal, you get the most. That's what this red arrow on the right represents. That's where people were diagnosed the most. Even though they were normal within seven years, they had almost all of the diagnosis uh, down the road. So it's clear and all the research shows basically the same thing. So it's clear this thing starts early. And so by the time maybe your blood sugar is consistently over 100, you should have been doing something two or three years prior. Because we all know, and if you're a physician, you know for sure. If you're in the insurance industry, you probably know better. But once you get labeled with some condition and you get diagnosed and it gets into the system, whether you're taking medication for it or not, it's it seems like it never goes away. So if you can do anything you can to keep it from ending up there, then you should do that. To, in, in other words, that's the prevention uh, approach. So I want, I want to give you guys a little pop quiz. Hopefully you've had some extra cup of coffee after dinner. Uh, for those group of people that were divided into low, medium, and high based on their blood sugar and insulin resistance scores, the top five conditions that they tracked were high blood pressure, let me see if I get them right here, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, the CHD stands for coronary heart disease, cancer, and then stroke. What do you think was the number one thing they were diagnosed with seven years down the road? Of these five things based on a blood sugar and insulin score? Type 2 diabetes? Anybody have anything else? I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? Because we're talking about blood sugar, we're talking about insulin resistance. You would think that type 2 diabetes is the thing that they're most frequently diagnosed with. Of those five, I'm sorry? Coronary heart disease? High blood pressure? I got them all. Somebody's right somewhere, right? Everything's the same. So this is what, this is the actual order. High blood pressure is number one. So blood sugar problems and insulin resistance cause blood, blood pressure problems. And frankly, cholesterol problems are caused by insulin problems as well. So all three of those conditions, while, the, while we have different medicines for them uh, and we have different treatments and you may go see a cardiovascular or cardiologist for your cholesterol and an endocrinologist for your diabetes, which is, really makes no sense because they're all caused by the same thing. 
Look at the number two diagnosis, cancer. Isn't that kind of disturbing? Diabetes is the fourth. We're talking about a blood sugar problem and it's not even the most frequently occurred diagnosis seven years down the road. So it's a real issue that we need to um, get a hold of and address. And unfortunately, when we try to fix the problem by following conventional uh, treatment and wisdom, we don't make much progress. I'm going to uh, take a few minutes here and describe how diabetes occurs. And hopefully, when, you, when that concept is, is uh, drilled into your brain, you'll understand why taking medication to control blood sugar isn't really fixing your problem. So we hear about people with type 2 diabetes, and it's, uh, and as I said earlier, the, the, the mechanism that we attack is that um, blood sugar is the problem. We get pharmaceutical treatment to control blood sugar and to reduce blood sugar, and that's supposed to fix the problem. But as soon as we stop taking that medicine, blood sugar goes back up. And the reason it goes back up is because we still have this problem. So the real problem, uh, a lot of people will say, is that it's insulin resistance. So you eat something, your blood sugar goes up, and your, your body releases this hormone called insulin. Insulin's job is to help reduce blood sugar by storing it, right? Either as glycogen in your liver and muscle tissue or as fat in your fat tissue. So that's insulin's job. When you're type 2 diabetic, your blood sugar's up and your insulin's up. And, and the conventional wisdom is that your insulin is up and staying up because your body needs more of it to do the same job that it used to need, that it used to be able to do. So your insulin is building up. So you've got blood sugar and insulin building up. The real problem is neither of those. So you can take glucophage or insulin or whatever to reduce your blood sugar. That's not going to affect your insulin levels. It's not going to, it's barely going to affect your blood sugar, but it's not fixing the problem. The real problem is that each and every one of us has what's known as a personal fat threshold in the, re, uh, in the research literature. So you may have seen people that are skinny, type 2 diabetics, and wondering, well, how can they be skinny and, and have type 2 diabetes? Most people that are type 2 diabetic are overweight. That's true, most of them are, but not all of them are. And so what happens, we eat foods that raise our blood sugar, and we constantly do this, and that sugar, that blood glucose, gets converted to triglycerides, and those triglycerides get stored in our fat tissue, right? And over time, those fat tissues get full because we don't do anything to empty them out. We don't change our diet. We don't really exercise enough to, to reduce the amount they're holding. So these fat cells, they get full. Now, the fat cells, they can grow so they can take more, but we don't change anything, so we fill them up again. And then they expand again, and we do the same thing over and over again. At some point, they can't expand anymore, but guess what? They can multiply. So now we've got new fat cells that get filled up. And we repeat this process, and, and then we're 50 years old, and we're going, what the hell happened to me? I gained 50 pounds since I was in high school. Right? At some point, the cells can't split or multiply, and they can't hold any more fat. So your blood sugar's up, your triglycerides are up, right? If you've been diagnosed, you probably were told that your triglycerides were up too. And your fat cells are full, and insulin's supposed to be doing this job of getting rid of that stuff, and it's, it can't do it because there's no place for it to go. So now it starts getting packed into your, your organs, your trunk, the trunk of your body. That's known as visceral fat. And if you want to look it up, it's V-I-S-C-E-R-A-L. That's a very dangerous fat to have on your body. But it's at this point that you become type 2 diabetic because your body doesn't know what to do with anything. And the amount of fat that you can store on your body is different for each and every person. It's just that most people that are type 2 diabetic are also overweight. But when we have this problem, 
The fix is to reduce the amount of fat that's on our body so that we have a place to store this stuff and then our insulin levels can come down. But if we don't do that and we only take medicine to control blood sugar, what are we fixing? Uh, are we fixing anything? No. That's why we have to take medicine every month. And the problem is, and the problem is the chronically or constantly elevated insulin levels are bad for our whole vascular system. Which is why you have all these comorbidities of dialysis clinics because the kidneys are going bad. Uh, liver problems, vision problems, circulatory problems, pain problems, sores that won't heal, all of that. Because wherever you need healthy blood and to get rid of uh, uh, blood that needs to be cleaned, that's vascular. And the vascular system is getting messed up with insulin. Question? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to take you off track. But, but the one thing that's going through your mind here is all I'm thinking about is the commercial on TV where, you know, grandma and grandpa are yeah. fat and lazy, but don't worry, we've now got an injection that can take a last a week instead of every day. So yeah. you can do whatever you want to do, you just take that an injection. Is, is this a, 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 a big farmer thing about hiding the problem? I mean, why are we not, why are we not being educated? Well, there's... Um, there's certainly plenty of uh, pharmaceutical conspiracy theories uh, around. Um, where is the actual problem? I don't know. I, I tend to be less um, negative or accusatory towards pharmaceutical companies, and I tend to be more uh, blame targeting to the, towards the FDA because they set the guidelines on treatment and treatment guidelines, and so pharmaceuticals are developed based on that. Yeah, I, I, I follow your point, Mr. Ryan, but the thing that concerns me, if we want people to change, the first thing that you, the first phase that you have to go through is being aware of the need for change. Yeah. And everybody's got to have it and come to it. Right. Yeah, right, 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 right. And, and, but I think that's a huge uh, ship that you've got to turn in the, in the ocean. And it, just last summer, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which is the governing body for clinical endocrinology that uh, works with diabetic patients, they finally came out with a position statement that said, you have to tell your patients that they have to do more than take medication to control their blood sugar <coughs> because they're not reducing their risk for all those comorbidities like we had been saying. So that's one step in the right direction, at least, and so we need bigger groups doing that. We need, you know, I'm on the board of the American Diabetes Association, the national board. I mean, I don't even want to tell you to go look at their sponsors page, but um, it's hard. We have a massive problem. Yes, sir. How big a role does wine consumption or alcohol consumption play? Uh, well, my uh, my standard answer to any question like that is it depends. <laughs> uh, let, let me finish up real quick and then I'll answer some questions, but I'll, I'll address that one by saying it depends on the extent to which your body's able to control blood sugar and, and, and burn fat tissue, right? So if, if you're not diabetic and if you're not struggling with all this stuff, it's probably not going to be a big deal. But if you're full-blown diabetic and you're taking medication and you're having a hard time controlling it, you probably don't want to be drinking. So not, you, you don't want to be drinking much. Uh, Certainly, uh, beer and that kind of stuff. Right, so medication doesn't do any of the stuff that you need to do to get accomplished to make yourself healthier. You're only kicking the can down the road. And, and you can't tell, you can't say, yeah, well, medication helps. Uh, bull bleep again, because how many people are taking their medication and following the doctor's orders? And still we have dialysis clinics popping up like weeds in your yard right now, right? So that's not, that's not random. So what do you gotta do? You've gotta be the red pea and the green, green pea pie. You've gotta do things differently. You've gotta, you go see your doctor and all that stuff. But the first, and, and maybe the only thing you need to really change, but the first and most important thing you need to change is your diet. 
Because the food that you eat dictates a lot of this stuff. And so you have to get better. Your body has to get better at burning fat, right? That's what we need to do. We need to burn that fat and get it out of the fat cells. When you're in this metabolic predicament, your body really struggles to burn fat. It makes it harder to lose weight. So you kind of get stuck, which is also why you never leave, right? That, remember that red group? You never leave. So you've got to be able to turn that around and, and fix that. So there's really only uh, a few things that you need to do, and, and this is the stuff we talk about with the academy. The first thing you need to do is uh, eliminate all processed junk from your house. Don't eat any of that. I don't care if it doesn't taste sweet. Uh, if it says sugar-free on there, it's not. It's still carbohydrate-based, and that's going to raise your blood sugar, and that's going to be part of the problem. Um, you, you probably want to start reducing the amount of chicken that you eat and replace it with beef and seafood. Room, that's what ruminants are, red meat. And if you, can, if you hunt for your food, you can eat, as, eat as much of that meat as you want. That stuff's better than anything you can buy at the store. Vegetables. Um, above ground, green, leafy vegetables. Eat as much or as little of those as you like. They really, a pound of broccoli can, contains like 75 calories. So in terms of contributing to your weight, they have little uh, to no impact. In the academy, we recommend four cups a day uh, pre-cooked whey. But the reality is you can, you can get by with uh, very little amount in terms of uh, vegetables. Uh, this is really the hard one. Does anyone know how many grams of sugar are in a medium-sized banana? 15? We're going to play right, prices right higher. 29. Well, uh, every medium sized banana is not the same, but we'll just say 29 or 30. Does anybody know how many, how many grams of sugar are in a normal sized Snickers bar? 27. So if you eat a banana, Every day, you, you're better off from a blood sugar perspective of eating a Snickers bar because you're getting less sugar in your body. So these things are all the same. And, and like I said earlier, it does, even if it doesn't taste sweet, if you know someone that's a type 2 diabetic, ask them what bread does to their blood sugar. It spikes it. It doesn't. In the academy, we have this thing called metabolic sugar. It's things that raise your blood sugar that even don't taste sweet. So... Most fruits, probably 99% of fruits, if you're in this condition, you, in this position, you probably shouldn't be eating them. Because all they do is perpetuate it and make it worse. These are all the same. When we could line up Snickers bars, Skittles, Oreos, bread, chips, pasta, um, cake in a box, brownies, all of those things, they look and taste different, but the first ingredient in almost everything there is flour. And flour's the problem. Flour's the first ingredient in cake, but cake tastes sweet because it all has sugar. Flour's the first ingredient in bread. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's whole wheat or not. It's, it's flour. The only thing that's different between cake and bread is the lack of sugar and food coloring that make it taste sweet and give it a different color. Essentially, that's it. So we're eating foods that really are high in processed production, low in nutritional quality, high in blood, blood sugar spiking, low in nutritional value. So they don't feed our body, they spike our blood sugar, and we really struggle to burn fat and can't really fix that. Um, beef, one ounce of beef has 30 something percent more potassium than one ounce of banana. Yep. Chicken breast, almost none. Um, fatty seafood like salmon um, is not as high as beef, but it's, I think it's about 18 or 19 percent. So this idea that you need vitamins and minerals from fruits and vegetables, vegetables maybe, fruits, you're better off skipping the sugar. I mean, it's just, candy and a dressed up label. And so if you do that, if you do those two things or three things, I, 
you know, the, the, the vegetable part, I mean, I, I don't want to say yes or no, but, you know, if you eat a whole bunch of them, it's not going to be a problem. If you don't eat them, it's not going to be a problem. The protein part is something that's important, and getting rid of all the junk is just as important. Do that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're going to be less hungry because you're feeding your body good food and you're, you're burning fat tissue, which will also supplement your hunger. And then in a few months, you're going to be the smiley person. You're not going to be... The other day I was in the... Um, I think I was in Target. I don't remember where I was. Um, but I was picking up some uh, medication, uh, some over-the-counter uh, medication at the pharmacy in uh, a Target. There was a lady in front of me. I don't know how many prescriptions she bought, but it, she had two Target bags full of prescriptions and it was I don't remember it was either a hundred and sixty eight or hundred and seventy eight dollars out of her own pocket for all of that stuff I'm sure she's one of the sad blue people here I don't want you to be the sad blue people anymore just be the happy yellow people and all of that comes in, in our this program we call the Academy that top line there is our website and we have a special going on for the next three weeks, I think till uh, March 17th, two, two weeks from this Sunday. And you can get these slides if you want to come and see me afterwards, just give me your card, I'll send them to you, um, and we'll get you on that, that coaching um, program. And if you're charged with groups, we have a, this program that I'm teaching now, is also certified by, miraculously, it's certified by the CDC as a diabetes prevention program. So we have special rates for uh, employers and their groups that we can do this for. And here's all of our social media stuff. And uh, thank you. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Yes. I'm great, Jill. How are you? Right. Where lately we've been told to stay away from the red meat, no more chicken, so I'd like to yeah. know about that. And then also you mentioned fruit, and I know food is a lot of sugar, but I'd like to know about berries, blueberries, yeah. raspberries, and all that. Okay. Okay. All right, so the, the, the answer to your first question is, uh, did everyone hear her question, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you look at the kind of fat that is detrimental to, to your health, a Tyson Pilgrim farm raised chicken breast is very high in fats that are bad for you. Polyunsaturated fats. Because it's because of their digestive system. They're eating foods that they normally wouldn't eat. So if you, if you bought a chicken and threw it, around, threw it in your backyard, it would be walking around and eating every bug it could get a hold of. But when they come from these kind of places and end up as a standard chicken at your grocery store, the, the main part of their diet is seed and grain. And seeds and grains are high in polyunsaturated fats, which are really detrimental to our health. And so we want to consume less of that type of fat. And so if we want to do that, then we have to eat less chicken, right? On the, conversely, beef and red meat and ruminant animals they have a very complex and multi-chambered stomach and digestive system. So none of those fats end up in the tissue. That's, that's why. And what was the second part of your question? Oh, berries. Just about anything that, uh, that has a berry in it um, is going to be not net zero, but pretty close to zero in, net, in sugar. So, they're, so in moderation, those things are fine. Yeah. Or you're playing Greek yogurt. Back here, right here, and then we'll go to the back of the room, and then you. Hello, thank hey. you for coming. Uh, number one, you said a word about exercise exercise. Yeah. And the question would be why not? Okay. And uh, the second question is, what percentage of pre diabetic I'll answer your second question first. Oh, are, are you done? I'm sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> you look like you're going to keep talking. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll answer your second question first. A hundred percent of pre-diabetics can, can go back to normal. And then, frankly, almost all type twos, depending on how long they've had it and what medications they're taking and dosage, they can almost get back to remission. Certainly they can make a lot of progress and improve their health no matter where they are. Um, so don't be, don't be so hard on yourself if you think you've had it for too long and can't do anything about it. The first question was, why didn't I talk about exercise? Exercise is important, um, but you know, we're all, I'm all limited on, on time, first of all. Second of all, um, I, it's hard for me to say that you should just go burn some calories because the wrong kind of exercise can make things more problematic when you're type 2 diabetic. You have to exercise in a way that helps your metabolism, and some things make that worse based on the current condition. And uh, not that it won't be helpful, it's just going to take longer and it's going to end up being more likely that you get frustrated that you're not getting results. Or, more importantly, when you exercise and if you're doing too much of it, even if it's the right thing, it's going to make you hungry. And if you're hungry, you're going to eat. And if you eat, you may eat the wrong thing. And if you eat the wrong thing, you're back to square one. So. Uh, that's kind of why I didn't talk about exercise. We have time. One, one more question. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Who? We? Oh, okay. Sorry. In the back, out. You can come up. You guys can come you up. Can see me personally. At, we're running out of time. So last question, Joe, if you would please. Um, what about you go with any pharmacy and you see shelf after shelf of all these supplements? Yeah. Out there. What about? Any value? No value? Most of it's junk. And then the second part. What about the one meal a day? All right, so those are two very good questions. Did everyone hear his questions? Yes. So the first question was about supplements, are they any good? And the second, uh, second question was about one meal a day. On the first question, um, most supplements aren't very good. I think the only thing that is good if you get the right kind and the thing that you need to pay attention to, not the only thing, but the main thing you need to pay attention to is vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is, it's called the vitamin, but it really acts like a hormone um, in terms of its impact and effects everywhere. And if you're low on vitamin D, it's associated with all of these chronic conditions. So uh, get that tested, get your vitamin. If you can take notes, next time you go see your doctor, get your uh, vitamin D tested on your blood test. Because it's not standard, but they'll do it if you ask. Um, what would you, I forgot to do the question, sorry. I'm having a senior moment. In, yeah. <laughs> one meal a day. Okay, oh, okay, good. Um, I think one meal a day is actually an outstanding dietary plan if you can do it. All of this nonsense about eating six meals a day or eating, more frequent, eating meals more frequently to manage your blood sugar it's metabolic nonsense, and it makes absolutely no sense with how our metabolism works. One meal a day is very helpful, it's very healthy, and guess what? If you're eating 2,000, well, I don't have my pictures up here. Uh, if, if you eat 2,000 calories a day, and if you eat 2,000 calories in your one meal a day, you're gonna have a hard time doing that because it's a lot of food at one sitting. When would you do the one meal a day? Let me answer this question first. But when you're going those other 23 hours without food, you're burning a lot of fat, so you're fixing the problem. When would you eat your meal? I mean, if you're only gonna eat one meal a day, it doesn't matter if you do it at breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever. Um, if you're truly only doing that, then it doesn't even matter if you do it one hour before bed. You just do it whenever it's convenient for you. I think most people, I coach people that have done that, most people that do that find that it's easier to do it after work because it's, once you get rolling, it's easy to not have breakfast, and then you can just skip lunch, and then you don't get hungry, you don't get sleepy in the middle of the afternoon, and you get home, you're ready to eat. So I think that's called intermittent fasting, and it's a great approach uh, to help. So based on, based on time, I'm gonna call it. So I, Brian, I really appreciate Thank you being with us today. Thank you.